I really think this conversation should be happening in the plant parent community more, so let's get it started. Bang, bang, grow, YouTube show. So plant friends, I'm so excited about today's video for you because it is what I like to call plant adjacent. So it is a plant inspired video, but sometimes I like to experiment with my content and do these adjacent categories that I think really kind of feed into plant parenthood and plant parenthood is also feeding into it. So this video is actually about sustainability. I'm so excited that I finally was able to have Nick from Farmer Nick NYC, you might know him from Netflix, The Big Flower Fight TV show, um, onto the podcast for a talk about how to live more low waste as a human, which is today's video, and also as a plant parent, because there are tons of opportunities to incorporate a more sustainable approach to plant parenthood and to life. And I thought Nick would be the perfect guest because he is the most epic plant parent. He is fully rooted in the plant space and in sustainability. So I'm so excited to actually bring you two videos today and next week featuring Nick and some of our conversations. So make sure that you like this video and click subscribe because you do not want to miss next week's video, which is all about plant parenthood. So the thought of sustainability is something that's been circling my mind a lot. Um, I think that it's super intimidating. I think people hear zero waste, low waste, and sometimes I think, and I'm definitely guilty of this, just kind of shutting off, but there are so many small adjustments that we can make to just start shifting and moving the needle a little bit closer to being more sustainable. So for example, today, the outfit I'm wearing for this little vlog intro is entirely thrifted, and that's one of the topics that we talk about with Nick today, but I'm gonna let him talk to you about it. This is something I'm really curious to explore further in 2021, so please let me know if videos like this resonate with you and if podcast episodes like this resonate with you, and I highly suggest after watching this video checking out the full podcast where Nick and I dive even deeper. It's linked in the show notes. So this was a very long interview and this is a very short clip, but these are Nick's specific tips for how we can start leading a more low waste lifestyle in general. So little hacks, little shifts that we can be making to lower our waste and help show up to the sustainability movement the way I think we all want to. Enjoy. What does waste mean? Oh, man, that's, that's a loaded question, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> You know, waste, I, I, my definition of waste is, is something that will truly end up in a landfill, right? Okay. And, and that's, that's the goal to avoid. Um, I know some people have different definitions of it, but for me, it's like, if this does not exist in my house mm -hmm. or in some kind of function and ends up in a landfill, landfill I have failed in that way. Okay. Um, so if I'm going to uh you know limit my waste i'm going to save things not in a hoarder kind of way just mm -hmm. enough to, to keep it clean and simple but at the same time you know trying to find different uses for as many things as possible and give it a new life even if it ends up in the landfill in 10 years it's still 10 years that it served a purpose and i didn't need to get something else um so don't just think in the current uh moment it's also in the future moments as well a big light bulb for me with waste, a light bulb moment for me with waste was when New York City rolled out its composting program mm. and we got a composting bin and started composting. And when I started realizing how much food waste was going in our garbage bags that was going yeah. into the dump, that was like a huge realization for me in regards to waste. And then obviously like every, plastic being a big thing single single use plastics is the thing we think most about and okay. i you know I, I think i'm not against buying something that's made of plastic if i can use it forever right it's mm -hmm. going to be here forever right so i might as well use it forever and if i'm not able to do it can you buy it from a company that works with a recycling a proper recycling agency like TerraCycle? for example, which has yeah. partnered with many brands to allow you to take, you know, Tupperwares or things like that and give them new life, send them back and replace those products and recycle them efficiently. Because, you know, believe it or not, we might throw our plastics inside the, the bin and feel really good about ourselves, but a, the vast majority of that plastic is not actually recycled. Um, so it may make us feel good in the moment, but doesn't actually have a good impact. 
Yeah. Like what's the deal with that? I've heard that a lot of the stuff we think that we are quote unquote recycling isn't actually getting recycled. Yeah. I mean, it, it depends on uh, your, your local communities, sort of uh, municipality programs for that um, mm -hmm. because it's all about organizing, right? right. Uh, there are certain labels and numbers that are assigned to those recycled goods that if they're not at the right facilities, they're not going to be, you know, properly disposed of or recycled. And one of the things that I really struggle with from a, a greenwashing perspective, which is when companies will say, oh, look, we're doing this one sustainable thing out of the 99 things that we do that are horrible. Like, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I see most about, uh, or see most often rather, is the number of compostable plastics. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, don't worry, like the top of your salad is compostable, so it's all good. But how many people are realizing that A, it requires a special facility? How many people are actually gonna go to that facility versus how many people will just say, oh, I'm done with my salad, throw it in the recycling or throw it in the trash. There's no right. point in a compostable good if it's not actually getting composted. So that's really important and understanding if something is truly biodegradable or not versus mm -hmm. something that is compostable. I mean, I use this phone case from Pela and I could bury this when I'm done and then it's gone. And that's awesome. Do you have resources or books that you would suggest listeners to go check out uh, so, in, in this specific thing? Cause I feel like for me, I'm like, oh gosh, I got a lot to learn when it comes to this. Yeah. You know, so, so not necessarily books, although I, I probably should brush up on some of the more current uh, processes and stats out there, but Lucy Biggers uh, has been okay. a tremendous influence on me. She's the sustainability sort of reporter and producer at Now This. She's gone to these landfills. She's gone to recycling facilities and shown the behind the scenes. And I think those videos are, are so productive uh, because they literally show you exactly what's happening and it's quick content too. So it's pretty enjoyable. Amazing. Okay, we'll link to her and her work in the show notes. Um, thank yeah. you for that. So sorry, I interrupted you in the midst of your tips um, for, with clarifying questions, but you were saying. Um, so one, one that we talked about before, um, which is buying quality uh, mm -hmm. versus, you know, buying something that you're going to have to replace. And, you know, the, the thinking fast mentality will be, why would I buy the, the $100 sweater when I can buy the $20 sweater, which looks just as good? And reality, in reality, if you break it down financially, because that's most people's biggest driver, they think things that are sustainable are more expensive, which they are in the short term. But if you have to buy that sweater 10 times over the course of you know, 20 years because it's low quality, it rips, it this or that, versus just keeping that $100 sweater once, you've saved a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. So I think taking a, a moment to reflect on that and say, okay, you know, yes, this is better for me now, but will it be better for me in the future? And is it yeah. better for the environment at all? Um, those are important questions that really give me a moment of pause when I am shopping. And to be honest, and this brings me to my next topic is that I, I haven't shopped for anything new in over a year. Um, really? Yeah, I, I have not bought anything net new in I think over a year and a half now. Um, I haven't like gone to a mall and like bought myself like a new jacket or anything like that. Everything that I get is thrifted. And mm -hmm. that is the best way to do it because even if you're buying something that isn't necessarily good for the environment when it was made, you're preventing that thing from going to a landfill and you don't have to buy a new product because even if you're buying the most sustainable product in the world there was there was still energy required to produce it there was still resources water, used, yeah. water all these things transportation costs to ship it to where you are right so buying not new things has become a, a big sort of tenant of, of my consumerism mm -hmm. and there's so it's never been easier to do it whether it's ebay or facebook groups or buffalo exchange any of these kind of thrift stores it is it is really a fantastic way to find some cool new finds and it's kind of fun to go there and like not know what you're gonna get that's so interesting wow
And when you, when it comes to having to get something new, like if you're getting a new bed or if you're getting a new, you move and need furniture or like something new, then are you going to companies who use recycled products? Is that yes. the kind of filter you go through? Uh, not just recycled products, but also just seeing like if they are manufacturing something new, how are they doing it? Um, so the best example uh, is this company called uh, Medley, which makes the most beautiful furniture that, that I've seen. And it is done in a way that every aspect of the manufacturing process is accounted for. So it's all handmade here in California. Um, it uses FSC certified wood, which is when you go into a forest, you're responsibly harvesting that wood as opposed to just chopping down the whole forest. And there's many um, sort of uh, restrictions and limitations that they have when sourcing that wood. Uh, a lot of their products are made from bamboo, which is one of the more sustainable mm -hmm. materials that you can have because it grows like a weed. It's essentially just a grass. Um, and when I spoke with them, um, they're, they're a family owned business. And the, uh, one of the executive, executives of the business said, you know, I'm a mother and I wouldn't want my kids to be on something that was A, harmful for their health, or B, harmful for the environment. And I wanna set that standard. So um, I fell in love with them. Um, their, their furniture, you know, again, would fall into that category of like, hey, it's probably pricier than the Ikea, but like, is it going to last forever? And is mm. it a better impact on the environment? The answer is unequivocally yes. So in putting together this sort of what I call the eco-ethical bedroom, you know, the furniture selections were the same. Avocado mattress, same kind of thing. The Cayuchi sheets, all these brands, which I'm happy to send over to you so you can link it out as well. Um, they're doing things so mindfully and with so much thought for the environment. It, it was hard to, to not support them. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of reframing that happens in how you show up. It's it makes me think of like a business that has like a code of ethics or, you know, a, a, you know, tenants, like core tenants. Yeah. Um, you kind of make some core tenants for yourself as a consumer and decide how you want to show up as a consumer, which I think is something that a lot of people very comfortably don't evaluate, you know, because yeah. we don't really have to right now because you can just like click a button and get whatever you want oh, delivered that, over to you. It's so easy. I've heard about this, um, you know, people recycling, thinking they're recycling and not actually recycling and, and that kind of stuff. So what are the common mistakes that you see people make in the beginning of, of their journey, of their low waste journey? Oh, man, that, I mean, I, I've made every mistake. Yeah, <laughs> <There are various laughs> I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm still making um, a bunch of them. <laughs> so... And uh, this is what I think composting is a little bit more complex uh, than mm -hmm. people give it credit for. Um, you know, if you are a, a professional composter, you'll recognize that there are uh, certain ratios between the brown and the green, green right. being your food scraps, brown being your, your yard waste um, that need to be achieved in order to create the right soil mix. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've seen uh, some gardeners where they'll only use their food scraps and that's good from a, you know, that food scraps didn't end up in the landfill perspective, but it can alter their soil and can, um, you know, change the way their the plants are growing. So um, that's one mistake I, I often see um, from, a, from a low waste side. Um, I see too many people falling victim to like, oh, I have to buy new products that are low waste and they, they recycle everything in their home. Oh, right? Because they say, oh, I've got a good clear, clean house. I'm going to just get rid of everything and restock it with the right things. And in reality, it should be, okay, let's take a look at those things first. Now let's do an audit and see, okay, these 10 things I can keep and repurpose and do something different. Whereas these 10 things, yeah, maybe I may, might need to replace it. So we get so excited when we want to you know, take on a new project that we very much jump to the consumer side first, as opposed to saying, okay, let's take inventory first and then I can make some more educated choices. Yeah, because I definitely feel like in the low waste uh, move it, movement, you see everyone with like all of their, you know, bamboo forks and or or whatever else. But it's not necessarily about having the right thing. It's just about working with what you've got. And just like you said, um, what about I? This might be a weird question, but I I've gotten into the practice of this because I had a roommate who told me. But 
with when you do recycle, you have to wash all the containers, right? Like if they're dirty, they're going to be taken off the yeah, uh, I, I don't know the, the true specifics behind that. It's something my mom always preached when I was little. Uh -huh. which is that if this isn't clean, they're not going to be able to, to take this and recycle it properly. So mm -hmm. um, I'm always washing uh, my aluminum cans, um, things like that, that, that go into the recycling. Um, my, it's funny, my grocery shopping is actually 100% plastic free. Um, that's mm -hmm. the one area where I, I have truly zero waste. Um, and, you know, the aluminum cans are something that I, I would consider zero waste because aluminum can be recycled properly and it's not, you know, a one-time plastic purchase. Um, but if those cans aren't clean, then you're not going right. to be able to, to effectively, you know, handle that yourself um, or handle it at the facilities. And, uh, you know, one, one way to get around that um, is to find bulk stores. I think bulk stores are, are such a cool way to, you know, fill up on items that you might traditionally buy in plastic. Mm -hmm. And I know it's tough during the pandemic, depending on which grocery stores you're going to, they might have shut down their bulk sections, but if you can find it, bring your own jars and everything like that is a great way to limit your waste. How did you, yeah. So what does that look like for you? A hundred percent zero waste grocery shopping. I mean, I have a million produce bags, <laughs> just okay. like, you know, these are bags that I've gotten from every event where for some reason over the last two years, giving a canvas bag away at an event was like something everyone the had thing. to do. And you yeah. end up with a sack of canvas bags and you're like, how yeah. is this sustainable? It's so uh -huh. ironic, right? So I use a lot of those um, in the supermarket. I, I don't buy um, any of like the, the clamshells where you're having you know, your lettuces wrapped up in there. I'm not buying anything that's in bags. I'm not using the flimsy little plastic bags to take, you know, broccoli or limes or throw them in those bags. I have something for every occasion. Um, but it, it does get tricky, right? And I actually wrote a, a blog post about this um, called the sort of produce paralysis because should I buy the lettuce that came from California traveled thousands of miles to get here, but it's not in plastic? Or should I buy the lettuce that's in the plastic clamshell from Gotham Greens in Brooklyn? Right. That's and technically you, local. Exactly, you go through these, these crazy mental exercises in your head, trying to figure out which one's better. And ultimately I go for the one that doesn't have plastic because the plastic will be there forever. But man, if there's a way for these companies to develop new solutions in packaging, which I know they're working on, that aren't plastic based, I, I think it's going to be a game changer. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. Cause I definitely use those little plastic produce bags. So even just, do you just eliminate them and just put the broccoli right into your canvas bag and that's it? Or do you bring your own plastic bags that you put the broccoli in? Um, so I will, uh, and this was, this was a time where I think buying a, a sustainable product would be good. So I bought specific netted canvas bags, the little oh, small okay. ones. Mm -hmm. um, that are great for individual pieces of produce. I'll put those in my cart and then I have the bigger canvas bags that I got at those events. And those mm -hmm. are like my shopping bags. Got um, it. So I don't need the brown ones or anything like that. And then when it comes to stuff you buy in like boxes, like cereal or like stuff like that, you're doing all bulk. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it's tough because I want to buy, you know, <laughs> the cereals and things like that, but right. you open up the cardboard box and then there's, you plastic know, bag that, inside. Yeah. that single use plastic bag, which, you know, I have nightmares of a sea turtle getting its head stuck into, right? Of course. So, no, of course. So targeting single use plastics, that sounds like that's the, that's the low hanging fruit for anyone that's who the wants low to hanging start. Fruit. The easiest way is, is avoid in the produce section, those really thin flimsy bags, avoid mm -hmm. those at all costs. Um, get yourself uh, a set of produce bags or reuse some bags that you might have at home and have those be the, the way to, uh, you know, go with your produce, especially. But people think, oh, it's going to increase the cost of my produce shopping. Like These bags weigh like not even an ounce. Right. Like what mm -hmm. produce are you buying where an ounce is going to be <laughs> the difference, right? So Truffles, right? <laughs> yeah. If it's truffles, that's a different story. Right. <laughs> but, uh -huh. um, really and and they appreciate you for it when you go into the store um mm -hmm. and i think more and more employees and more stores are embracing this and encouraging it within their consumers totally i mean whole foods gives you a 
you know, you get a discount. dime off or something. Yeah, you get a discount for every canvas bag you bring. So that's really interesting. Are there any um, hacks, like low waste hacks that you would recommend people trying? So, so my, I'm obsessed with mason jars. I love them. I think they look great for, for so many reasons. Um, but there's this one brand of salsa that I absolutely love, Green Mountain Gringo, and they have these beautiful mason jars. And it's not just about the mason jar, because oftentimes you may have found if you're trying to scrub the label off of a mason jar, there's some kind of adhesive on there, mm -hmm. which really sticks way too much. And you're left with this weird look and it's kind of sticky to the touch. That's not good. But whatever they do on their labels, if you put that mason jar when you're done with the salsa in a pot of warm water for 10 minutes, that label will just come right off and you have a perfectly pristine mason jar for yourself. And mm -hmm. I use these for drinking glasses. I use them for storing food. I'll buy the aluminum tops online so I can put those on top or reuse the one that I have. Um, mm -hmm. And I also use them for plant propagations. They look gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, having a stack of those and maybe there's other mason jars from different companies where I can mix and match with the heights. It looks beautiful, super easy to do. And I carry it around everywhere I go. I know you're not a coffee drinker, but do you suggest like bringing mason jars or like, you know, reusable cups to those, you know, those single use plastic moments? Yeah, I... I kind of have an emergency cup with me everywhere I go really? um, for, for those reasons. And if it's not a mason jar, it could be, you know, a reused plastic cup that I've had for a while or something along okay. those lines. Um, a lot of companies, uh, I know Starbucks in particular, um, sells their own version of those things, mm -hmm. which is fine, right? If you're a frequent Starbucks shopper, that's great. Um, but always ask and never be embarrassed to ask because I think people get shy and they don't want to cause a, you know, be a hassle or something like that. But just put your, your ego aside and realize, you know, I'm doing this for something greater than myself. I'm going to ask if they say no, great. I can move on. Yeah. Worst comes to worst as they say no. And then at yeah. least you can live with the fact that you tried, you know, it's a good lesson in rejection. <laughs> Absolutely. One of my favorite hacks is, um, and this one of my, uh, an influencer I know, she absolutely influenced me. I saw these on her Instagram and I bought them, but um, I love drinking through a straw, but I hate plastic straws and I haven't found like a good uh, substitute. And I saw these glass straws mm. um, and mm. they're like fully reusable, made of glass. They come with a cleaner. And so those are what I use. And then I try not, I, and I don't use straws when I'm out, but the bamboo straws, I feel like never took because they're they get really dirty on the inside and then you can't see through them so you can't really see like how dirty they're getting yeah and they give you those little pipe cleaner yeah. looking washers and everything um the, the the metal straws glass straws are great i love throwing those in the dishwasher because it makes it super easy yeah. um so that's a good one i like that I love Nick. I'm so excited to show you the next video next week. So make sure you're subscribed. Think about what actionable steps you're going to take from being inspired from this video. Let me know in the comments. And also, fun fact, but Nick was actually one of the inspirations for the urban farmer plant parent on my plant parent personality test. If you don't know what the plant parent personality test is already, it's a free three minute quiz that I've made for you guys. You take it and at the end of it, I give you your plant parent personality. And then based on your personality, results, I give you a free list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your lifestyle. So the link is in the show notes. If you haven't taken the test yet, make sure to take it and let me know if you're an urban farmer like Nick or maybe a mindful plant parent like myself. I'm so excited about thinking about these on a deeper level. I know for me, single-use plastics is an area that I can <laughs> really tremendously improve upon. So I'm going to be really excited to, once we get to our next home, really thinking about this really seriously and, and taking some of Nick's tips to heart. So I hope you all do too. And until next time and next week when we learn more about low waste, keep blooming and keep growing.